is another day of fellowship with the Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is what gathering together in a retreat is all about. You may have listened to the first uh, exhortation or teaching of this uh, retreat. The one that you're about to listen to right now is the second. And uh, in this meeting, as I've told you earlier, God has designed to do great things, remarkable things, things that are going to show forth in the course of time, things that are going to manifest in the course of time to our benefit. As is usual with us, when we come to the presence of the Lord at his table, we want to render some worship unto him and then take some other song for the benefit of our souls to prepare our hot soils to receive the awesome word of God. I want you to remember that the Lord Jesus Christ said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So before we pray, in order to take our message, we want to sing two songs. Song number one is taken from our song book, hymn number 10. After that, we will go to hymn number 209. Now we will all rise and go to hymn number 10. Hymn number 10 is a hymn of worship unto God, and it says, O oh, worship the King, all glorious above. O oh, gratefully sing his power and his love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and gathered with praise. O oh, tell of his might, O oh, sing of his grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy is space, his chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his part on the wings of the storm. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light, it streams from the hills, it descends to the plain and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, indeed we trust, nor find thee to fair. Thy mercy is how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. O measureless might, ineffable love, while angels delight to him the above, the humbler creation that is we, though feeble, through, though feeble their lays, with true adoration shall lisp to thy praise. <laughs> Oh, 
Number two zero nine two zero nine. Come, Holy Ghost, our hearts inspire. Let us thine influence prove. Source of old prophetic fire, fountain of light and love. Come, Holy Ghost, for moved by thee. The prophets wrote and spoke, unlock the truth, thyself the key, unseal the sacred book, expand thy wings, celestial dove, brood over our nature's night, on our disordered spirits move, and let thou now be light. God through himself within shall know. If thou within us shine, and sound with all thy sins below, the depths of love divine. you to sing a few uh, words of this song with me, the kind of thing we call uh, chorus. And uh, it is talking about God being with us. God is with us, God is with us, I know. I know God is with us. Yes, I. 
into prayer even at this moment remember that with prayer you prepare your heart soil before the Lord because he said he's with us and it is very clear the angels know it and every heavenly being knows it Jesus Christ our Lord knows it the Holy Spirit knows it and you know it you and I know it and I know it and that is the reason we sang the song. And it is true. It doesn't matter what argument anybody may have. Contrary argument. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. For this day is a great day. This hour is a great hour. I pray with you. I pray with you, Lord of heaven. Precious Redeemer, King of kings and Lord of lords. We come before you the creator of the ends of the earth, to thank you for a time like this, to thank you for another time before the Lord, at the table of the Lord. Thank you because of the giftings of the spirit of the Lord. Thank you because of what we know. Thank you because of the awareness that you are already creating in the hearts of the people, the necessary thing, the critical thing. Precious Father, thank you because uh, this time again, the word will come out and then we grow wings and then enter into the hearts of men. Precious Lord, and as a result, uh, they will have themselves changed and they will have uh, their lives uh, transformed and they will have uh, their minds entirely changed, illuminated. That is what your word and spirit will do and want to do. So I bless your name, precious Father, for the opportunity to be a minister of the word and the spirit in order that those things that have been speculated before or those things that have been promised will become realities in the lives of the people. Thank you very much for answering our prayers. Because we have made our prayers in the mighty name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And let me hear every one of you say amen. 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 Now you may be seated for the second teaching that I have already announced. The title is The Incredible Privileges God has conferred on the Watchman Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement and the reasons for so doing. I said that again, the 
privileges that God has conferred on the watchman, Catholic Charisma Renewal Movement, and the reasons for so doing. We are continuing with our dissertation on this our December retreat's crucial subject matter of having our eyes of understanding enlightened as the Apostle Paul passionately requested for the Ephesian believers. I'm going to read that. But before I read that, let me tell you that that word critical was particularly used. Not mechanically used, but particularly used. Something critical is something extremely important because of a future situation will be affected by it. So, eyes of understanding being opened, which is our team and which is what the Lord wants to achieve this time around, is a critical thing because in the future, the things that are going to happen in the future with you are going to be determined or dependent on this particular team or this particular uh, uh, issue. Now, we go to read the request, passionate request that Apostle Paul, knowing this truth, made to God for the Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1, we are reading from verse 15. Ephesians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 15, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us world who believe, toward us who believe, according to the working of his power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. In the course of our ministration, I'll tell you why the apostle made this passionate prayer. Now, I want to remind you that in our opening teaching, we defined the subject matter of having our eyes of understanding opened. And we also received some biblical examples of those of old who had their eyes of understanding opened and the incredible benefits that accrued to them. Besides, we also summarily informed that the Lord has conferred incredible privileges on the watchman concerning which our eyes of understanding must be opened if we must benefit from them. We also showed in that teaching that God will not fail to use the ministrations of this retreat to open our eyes of understanding to the riches at our disposal. We will now proceed to discuss a few items of the said incredible God's privileges conferred on the watchman. Following that, we will then discuss the reasons 
underlying the confinement of these privileges. We discuss the privileges, list a number of them, and then follow it up with showing the reasons underlying the confinement of such privileges. Now we go to point number one, the privileges that God has conferred on the watchman. Now for us to understand, let us first of all define the word privilege. A privilege is a special right or advantage that a particular person or group of persons has. Listen to that again. A privilege is a particular advantage or right, special one for that matter, that a particular person or group of persons has. Now you know that the watchman is a group of persons or group of believers made up of individual persons or individual believers. Now from this fact, it then follows that wherever tenable, the privileges conferred have been conferred to all true watchmen, wherever tenable. Listen to that. The privileges have been conferred to all true watchmen, both on individual basis and as a group. Now, the privileges in question are included, but not limited to the following, which I am going to list. And then point by point and say some words and make some remarks concerning each privilege. Now, number one privilege that we are considering is the fact that the Lord himself is the one that gave name to the ministry that you are into. The Watchman Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement is not my coinage. Is not the coinage of some group of elders. It was given directly by the Holy Ghost. After that, we have prayed for not less than two and a half years. And then I want to tell you this. We know that names matter, irrespective of the utter ignorance or foolishness of those who give names only for identification purposes. There are those who give names for identification purposes and they are not wise at all. I want to prove the point that names matter with some of the cases that we have in the scriptures where the angels gave names unto humans. And I want to begin with the name Abraham. In Genesis chapter 17, Genesis chapter 17, we are reading from verse 1 through to verse 6. Genesis chapter 17. And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me, and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abraham. But thy name sh shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations out of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. This man had the name Abraham, and the meaning of that name Abraham is exalted father. But God changed his name and then gave him name Abraham. 
And then the meaning of Abraham is father of a multitude. And Abraham eventually became the father of multitudes. We are talking about names. And then we also have in this same chapter the case of Sarai, the wife of Abraham. Now, in the same Genesis chapter 17, then we have these words. And verse 16. So let's read from verse uh, 16. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yeah, I will bless her. And she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said, In his eyes shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old, and shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear. And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Now, and then he had said for Sarai, like I had told you in verse, uh, uh, verse 14, and the uncircumcised man, child, whose flesh of the first skin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He had broken my covenant. And God said to with unto Abraham, and for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Sarah shall be her name because she is was supposed to be even a woman having children. She was a prince, and then but she was going to she was a princess, and now she was going to be a mother of many people. Now we have the same matter that we are discussing in the case of Jacob. Jacob was renamed Israel. Jacob originally meant supplanter, deceiver. And what his name connoted happened in the deceiving that his brother Esau received at his hand. Now we see that in the book of Genesis. Still, let's read from Genesis From Genesis, we are reading Genesis chapter 32, reading from verse 1. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host, and he called the name of the place Mahanaim. Now, and Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he, con and he commanded them, saying, Thus shall he speak unto my lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob said, Thus I have sojourned with Laban, 
and stayed there until now. And I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and men servants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find grace in thy sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he came to meet thee, and four hundred men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and divided the people that was with him, and the flocks and the herds and the camels, into two bands, and said, If he shall come to one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. And Jacob said, O oh my God, the father of Abraham and the God of my father Isaac, the Lord which said unto me, Return into thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal with thee, well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truths which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me, and the mother with the children. And verse 13 says, And the Lord there the same night, and took of that which came to his hand a present for Esau his brother. And now he took two hundred she goats, and twenty he goats, two hundred ewes, and twenty rams, thirty milk camels with their colts, forty kine and ten bulls, twenty sheasses and ten foals. And he divided them into the land of his uh, servants every drove by themselves, and said unto his servants, Pass over before me, and put a space between drove and drove, company and company. And he commanded the foremost, saying, When I saw my brother meeted thee, and asked thee, saying, Whose art thou, and whither goest thou? And whose are these before thee? Then shalt thou say, They be thy servant Jacob's. It is a present sent unto my Lord Esau, and behold, also he is behind us. Now, verse 20, And say ye moreover, Behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with a present that goeth before me. And afterward I will see his face. Peradventure he will accept of me. So uh, the present over before. So when the present over before him. And himself lodged that night in the company. And he rose up that night and took his two wives. And his two uh, women servant, uh, servants. And his eleven sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. Now verse 24. And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the holder of his thigh. And the holder of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go for the day breaketh. The angel of the Lord is the person. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob, meaning supplanter, meaning deceiver, which thing had reflected in my life, in my action toward my brother. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel But Israel, for as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. So this man was changed from being a supplanter to being a prince with God. And that is what names can do. And he became a prince with God in the course of time. 
And then you know what? The descendants of Jacob, uh, Israel rather, are princes with God. Even this day, having might, having economic might, having military might, as a result of what God had promised unto uh, Abraham, and as a result of what God had done in changing the name from Jacob unto Israel. Now, time has failed me to talk about our Lord Jesus Christ. He was named by the angel Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And when he came proper, when he came to come into the uh, lives of human beings in this world, the manifestations of his life showed that God was actually, and is actually with the people of this world, even at his time and even until the present day. Now, the name Watchman, Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement, as was given by the Holy Ghost, as I've told you, has a great import, and that is a privilege. That is a privilege. And uh, if somebody is given a name by God, I say that is a great privilege, a very great privilege, and then we must take note of that. Another privilege that God has uh, conferred on the watchman is the privilege of placing his word, his name, his spirit, and his power in the movement. Many, many times, in fact, all the times, when we gather in fellowship, our introductory remarks always show this. Welcome to the watchman, Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement, where God has placed his name, his power, his spirit, and his word. This is truth to the very letter. But you know what? It can become so formal. It can become so mechanical as if it is not a reality, but it is a reality. The word of the Lord is with us. Even the truth of God's word is with us. Let me show you what the Lord Jesus Christ said in the day that he was praying for his children. In John's Gospel, chapter 7, I want to read verses 8 and 14. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. In verse 14, I have given them thy word. Now listen to me. The truth of God's word is in the watchman. The spirit of God is in the watchman. As it is in me. And it's in many people. And now the power of God is in the watchman. You look around, you will see the power of God being in the watchman. The spirit of God is residing in the watchman. I didn't say that that is the only place the spirit of God is residing, but I'm talking about the spirit of God residing even, even continually in the watchman. Now, another privilege is the privilege of the watchman having the pulpit of many colors. Take note of the thing that I am saying. Pulpit of many colors. In Genesis chapter 37, let's read concerning the pulpit of many colors. Genesis chapter 37, reading from verse 1. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Beha and with the sons of Zippah, his father's wives. 
And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report, report of their misdoings. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because of his character, because of his piety, because, not only that, because he was the son of his own age, and he made him a coat of many colors. A coat of many colors was a symbolic dress that this father gave to this young man, 17 years old. It would symbolize superiority. It symbolized rulership. It symbolized somebody who had greater advantage than the rest of the people, who was uh, astronomically blessed. And so the people got offended with it. And now, how come that we have the pulpit of many colors? Let me tell you the story briefly, as I've been talking, saying before. In 1999, if I'm not mistaken, we are having a December retreat in a particular complex in Lagos. And now, before the retreat, a few days before the retreat, I found that I began to think of making a pulpit, a rostrum. And then, having read Woodwork in 1964 to 67 in a technical college, I came up and I began to design the pulpit. And I began to bring different species of wood. And then I went and got woodwork machinery, hand tools, and then was building and joining species to species. If you look at the one that I am sitting on right now, you will see that it is made of, of different kinds and different species of wood. There is mahogany, there is uh, uh, ash, and there is uh, some other species of hardwood. And I was doing that, doing that up to midnight, up to 1 a.m., up to 2 a.m., and then I didn't know what I was doing, but at a point in time, I heard the voice of the Lord within me saying, you are building a pulpit of many colors. And then this scripture that we have read concerning Joseph occurred. Now, what a significant thing. What an amazing thing. What an awesome thing that God gave you a pulpit of many colors, which means a superior pulpit, which means a pulpit that will bring out things that other pulpits will not bring out. That is the meaning. So it is a great privilege. Another privilege is the privilege of revelation knowledge time and again. We have the privilege of revelation knowledge time and again. And then in Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, we read from verse 13. Matthew 16 and verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do, the son, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of a living God. Thou art the Messiah. Revelation knowledge. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. We have the privilege of revelation knowledge by the day. Every now and again we come out with things that are deep down inside the mind of God. He made them known unto us through the pulpit of many colors. What a privilege it is. The Apostle Paul 
from time to time had revelation knowledge. You know what he said unto the uh, Thessalonians when he was going to talk about the rapture. We read from 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, and we are reading from verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, by the word of revelation knowledge, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent restraint them which are asleep, which have died. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Revelation knowledge. And that is what privilege that we have from time to time. And you know it. There is another privilege that God has given unto us. And that is a privilege of the spirit of God readily discerning and distinguishing between error and truth and between the genuine and the fake. That is why I am very happy. You know that sometime in times past long ago, I said, whosoever that wants to get involved in spiritual gifts, let a person go on. Whosoever that wants to manifest anything, let a person go on because whatsoever that is being manifested, if it's genuine, I will know. If it's not genuine, I will know. There is no need for prayer. I don't need to fast and pray for two weeks before I will know that somebody speaking in tongues is not from the Holy Ghost. Before I will realize that somebody that is prophesying is not from the Holy Ghost. Before I will realize that the dream that somebody has dreamt and then comes to share and then think that it's from God, that is not from God. The spirit of discernment as a gift is one of the privileges of the Watchman Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement. Another privilege is the fact that God has raised unto us a teaching priest whose eyes of understanding have been opened concerning God's unchanging standards and truths. By the grace of God, I am a teaching priest. In Second Chronicles, I am reading from chapter 15. Second Chronicles, chapter 15. We are reading from verse 1. Second Chronicles chapter 15. And from verse 1. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah the son of Oded. And he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you. While you be with him, and if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. Now for a long season, Israel had been without the true God, and without a teaching priest, and without the law. Now, but that is not the case in the watchman. There is a teaching priest. There is somebody 
that has been ordained to teach the truth of God's word and remain with those unchanging standards of God. The thing that the Bible calls even the ancient ways, the ancient landmarks. We also have the privilege of uh, being raised for what I can call the chiefest of assignments. What I can call the chiefest of assignments. And why do I say that? I look at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, and I compare it with some other scriptures as it pertains to us. Matthew chapter 11. And then we read from verse 7. And as they departed, Jesus began to say who unto the multitudes concerning John. When those people that came from John while he was in prison left, then Jesus began to say concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see a reed shaken with the wind, an unstable person? But what went ye out for to see a man clothed in soft raiment, gay raiment? Behold, they that wear such clothing, soft clothing, are in king's houses, king's palaces. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yeah, I say unto you, I'm more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall de prepare thy way before thee. Verily, I say unto thee, unto you, among them are born of women that had not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. Now there have been prophets that have come of old, and then there have been apostles, and we had Elijah, we had all the people, like Elisha, like a Jeremiah, and like Isaiah, and all the prophets. And but now Jesus Christ said, of all men, not just prophets, born of women, there had not arisen a greater than John. Why? Because he was very huge. No. Why? Because he was having a, a lot of miracles surrounding his ministry. No. Why? Because he had a ministry of introducing the Savior. He had a ministry of saying, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He had a ministry of showing the people the very Messiah, identifying him and introducing him to the Jews. And now, why do I now draw from that? What do I draw from that? We have the ministry of returning the people unto Christ and then informing the people that he is coming. That is a ministry that is like John the Baptist's ministry. Listen to me. When you heard me say, the Lord said we were five minutes to the midnight. Then after some years, he said we were two and a half minutes to the midnight. And after some time, we are now less than two and a half minutes to the midnight. And when you know, when you hear of the ministry of the watchman in Isaiah chapter 49, verses 5 and 6, and now said the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, it is a light that thou shouldest be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved of Israel. And I will give you also to be a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end, ends of the world. But then later on, he added this verse of scripture 
the shows that we are just doing what John did in his day. In Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, we are reading there from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 12. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. I have told you, and let me tell you again, how this scripture was given to me on a particular day, about five years or four years ago. It was that I was cogitating, I was meditating, and I was looking at all the problems of the ministry and all the problems that I had befallen me and all the health situations. And I was concerned, highly concerned, whether what we are doing was going to be accomplished or not. And I was filled with sorrow. And then in the sorrow, I slopped into bed. But I tell you what, early the next morning, this was a scripture that rang like a bell that woke me up. Now remember that we have this threefold end time project of raising an army of believers from among the denominations. And then for bringing those believers even to be prepared to make multitudes of people to come into the kingdom and then in, and now joining these believers, most of them from the denominations and the people that won, we are now given the uh, ministry of preparing them for the rapture, preparing them for the taking away of Jesus. It's not, not like the ministry that Jesus gave or the Father gave to John the Baptist. So we can say that we have the chiefest of uh, assignments from the Lord as a privilege. Now, I will not forget to inform you that over this period, I have said we have a ministry that has the purest of foundations. Now, time has failed me to be able to tell you the story of that ministry with purest of foundations. Another privilege that we have is what I have read already from uh, uh, Hebrew chapter 11 and verse 12. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. This is written, was documented concerning Abraham. But God now in the present day redirected it to him. So can I not then say that we have the privilege of having a type of Abraham in our midst in the ministry? If I say that, that is not an overstatement. It is a privilege. And now we have the privilege of special defense. The Lord has said to Abraham, now he said, Abraham, I am thy shield, fear not, and I exceeding great reward. Listen to me. It has been like that to the watchman, to true watchman. God has borne their defense all along. God has borne our defense. He has defended us. Listen to me. There were those, there were times that they looked for me to kill. There were those days when the brethren were incarcerated, put in the prison because of the name that, because of the name we are carrying. But now, today, God has defended us, defended us very magnificently of all those charismatic groups that arose in those days, having this name and that name and having the word Catholic in their names. They have all removed the word Catholic, excepting the Watchman Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement. What a defense God has given to us. Now, there is another privilege, the privilege of being a prick 
which cannot be kicked against, and the kicker getting away with it. The privilege of being a prick. This is what I keep saying unto whosoever that cares to listen. Let's look at what the Lord said unto Saul of Tarsus when he was on his way to Damascus to subdue and to undo the believers of that place in his madness against Christianity. In verse 3 of Acts of Apostles chapter 9, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to keep against the pricks. The prick is sharp object. Now let us imagine this. You have built a wall and a reinforced concrete wall for that matter. And now, while you were casting that reinforced concrete wall, you sharpened some rods, pinpointed them very sharp, and they are having points. And then you build them into that wall. And they are, their sharp points are just protruding. And then somebody comes around in all his foolishness and goes to use his leg, his foot, to kick that prick or to push that wall down. What will happen to the person? He will be... He will be bleeding the next moment and will bleed to death from his foot. That what the watchman is. It is a prick. That's the reason all the people that fight against it or are going to fight against it are wasting their time because it is a prick. We have the privilege of having God reserved the real miracles for us. Somebody will be saying, what do you mean? You wait. The future will tell the truth of what I am saying. We also have the privilege of being instruments of judgment. What do I mean? These are, this is revelation knowledge. There was a time I was looking for prosecutors. Oh, my people. And I was saying, who are the prosecutors? Prosecutor is a person that now begins to prosecute a criminal. Somebody that has been brought to court for the evil that he has done. And then he's quoting the law and then he's showing evidence and evidence upon evidence that this person should be committed to prison. That is the prosecutor. And now the Lord has uh, made the watchman to be a prosecutor. Remember, there is a court in heaven. And uh, the watchman is a prosecutor in that court. That is the reason when I say this one is not going to prosper because that one is evil. When I say this thing that has been gazetted against the watchman is not going to prosper, then that thing will not prosper. We are prosecutors. I am a prosecutor. And then we come before the court of heaven where justice cannot be denied. And we present all the cases and all the arguments. And the Lord will note, he said, this is a great privilege. Now, we have uh, this privilege of being elected to confront and to combat the Goliath of religious error. The Goliath of religious error. Oh, we know that there are Goliaths of religious error, even among in, Christian, in, in Christendom, among Pentecostals, 
But you know what? God has raised the watchman to use the truth of God's word and the power of his spirit to confront them and bring them down the way David brought down Goliath. I have told you that this is the time that erroneous places must crumble, must fail, must fall. I have told you that you do not need to worry yourself as to what you see, as to the bizarre things that you see, which are posted in the internet, and then people are doing bizarre things, and calling those things they are doing being of God. You do not need to worry because God will bring them down. He will make them mad. And I have said in times past that they will be mad. And people are saying, what do you mean? Must they literally remove their dresses from the pulpit and be naked? No. When somebody is doing a thing and then doing a thing, and then many, many people begin to see that what the person is doing is evil and begin to speak against the person. The person has become mad. When somebody leaves blowing the trumpet that should lead the people to singing, and the person is now blowing a trumpet that will lead the people, the tune, that will lead the people to cry. Is that person not mad? The people that are in some pulpits, behind some pulpits, are already mad because they are saying things and, and blowing trumpets that will send people to hell. So they are mad. Now, finally, I want to tell you the, about the reasons underlying the confinement of these privileges. Now, the reasons are as follows. The rule or the principle of God is, to, is this. To whom much is given, much is required from him. Let's read that scripture and I draw from it. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, and we are reading. Verse 48, but he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. That is God's principle. Now, to whom much is given, much is required from the person. Now, let us turn it around. The converse of this principle is true. And that converse is to whom much is required from, much must be given to the same person. To whom much is given, of him shall much be required. Now, unto him that much is required from, then much should be given unto the person. That is the converse of the statement. Now, what do I mean? God has given us a very huge and onerous assignment of preparing the church for the rapture. And that is not a small assignment, even in the midst of a dilapidated world, in a world that is on its head. In, 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 a, in, the, in, the, in such an untoward generation. And then he said, make men, multitudes of believers, rapturable believers, out of the people, and let your word fill all the ends of the earth, from the north to the south, and from the east to the west. Is that not a huge assignment? Is it not a huge demand? Is it not a huge uh, work to do? And now, having given that huge assignment, now 
Justice demands that much privilege should be given to the person. And I suppose that that is clear enough and that you have heard the truth. The watchman is bequeathed with a lot of privileges. Listen to me. I've told you what a privilege is. I'm not talking about the general things that the Lord has provided for the body of Christ, various denominations. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about privilege. And I tell you the meaning of the word privilege once more so that you can understand what I'm saying. A privilege is a special right or advantage that a particular person or group of persons has. That's what we're talking about. And I've enumerated some of them. And now we are going to rise up to pray on this. You need to pray and thank God and say, thank you, Father, for where I have found myself. Because it is a place that has a lot of privileges that are not found in other places. But wait a minute. It is very, very necessary that you should be following this teaching as it's progressing. Now, I want to tell you why there is a kind of delay in the coming of the messages. It was because after writing the things that I was writing, I found a need by the Holy Ghost to rearrange them. And now they arrange them in their uh, proper sequence, in the logical sequence. So we have told you about the eyes of understanding being opened, and now, now I've told you about the privileges that we have in the watchman, and then even the reasons behind the privilege that we have born uh, given. But now, when we come back, then we will take the message on the necessity of having our eyes of understanding open. Yes, it's necessary that we should have our eyes of understanding open unto these truths, unto these privileges, because somebody can have a privilege and is not having any awareness about it. And as a result, he cannot make use of it. So we'll come back and we'll show, we discuss the necessity of having our eyes of understanding open. And when we are done with that, we will come to another message that will now show us the mechanisms of having our eyes of understanding open. And now after that, we look at the challenging cases of those who had their eyes of understanding open. And then when we will have run through all those things, then you will have uh, agreed with me, you will have come to the conclusion, or you will have come to the experience of having your eyes of understanding open. As uh, we close, I want you to take note of this. Over the past 43 solid years, I have followed the law without backsliding one day, without having to go into sin and then having to confess and go into sin again and having to confess and go into sin again and having to confess and this and that. And now I'm saying I don't want to follow the Lord again. Despite all the trauma that came upon the prophet, despite all the grief that came upon the prophet, despite all the sorrow and all the heavy things that came upon the man, now there is no shaking. There is no backsliding. There is no looking back. There is no compromising. There is nothing like shift your status, shift your standard. Like the people have shifted standards. I listened to a message many, many years ago, and a man of God, well-versed, who has understanding, said 
that a time was going to come when the circumstances in the world will make preachers of the gospel, so-called men of God, change emphasis. And the emphasis will be to attend to those circumstances in the world. That thing has come to be fulfilled. In that day, I remarked what was said, and I said, this is true. And today, they have changed emphasis. Today, the world is filled with uh, people who are just motivating people. The world is filled with preachers who are just talking about the power of God, but do not talk about the holiness of God, who are talking about faith in God, saying without faith it is impossible to please God, but you know that you can please God with faith and at the same time go to hell. Now, but this man has, have, has not changed and will not change. And why is it so? It is because my eyes of understanding have been opened. There is no circumstance on this world. There is no person in this world that will propose a thing and bring out an ideology. And that is going to make me now begin to think twice as to whether Jesus Christ is coming again or not. Or as to whether holiness is required or not. Or as to anything that the Lord has said. Listen to me. Jesus Christ is not a man. He was a man, but he was the embodiment of God's truth. And when he came with that truth, he delivered it. And that truth is eternal. It does not change. He meant everything that he taught. But today, many, many people have relegated him to the background and then the things that he has said. And they have developed for themselves sweet things. Now, how come that somebody is standing? How come that you are standing? How come that our pastors are standing? How come that many believers are standing? When many people have strayed, people have lost their families and lost their marriages, but there are people that are still having their marriages despite all the things that happen to marriages in the present day. It must be because their eyes of understanding as to truth have been opened. Now, you need to pray, saying, Lord, this is true. I need to have my eyes of understanding open. You rise up on your feet wherever you are found. And raise your hands unto the Lord, the Lord of heaven and earth, who is sitting between the cherubims in the place of power, telling him, I have heard your word. I have heard your truth, and I stand by it. My eyes of understanding must be opened unto the privileges that we have so that I will be able to benefit from the privileges. Let it not be that I am in the midst, in the depth, or in the midst of clean, flowing river or stream. And then soap water entered my eye, and then was itching me, and itching me, and itching me. And I did not take advantage of the water in the which I am into. What a stupidity. What a foolishness. Let that not be a lot. Pray unto God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because he has selected to do great things, opening our eyes of understanding. And when your eyes of understanding are open, then you do not need many pastors to come to your aid. You will come to your aid by yourself. You'll be able to do many things by yourself. Be able to pray yourself out of predicament. You'll be able to believe God for whatsoever. You'll be able to have even all the defense that you need to have, all the intervention of God. Pray to God. Let us not be dull. Let us not kill with God. Let us not play religion. Let us become Christians. And as we do, the Lord of Sabaoth, who has promised, will open the eyes of understanding of the people as to the privileges that have been conferred on the watchman Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement. Eternal Father, want to bless your name because of the people. Want to thank you because of your word. Because your word is true. These things are not things that are not true. 
They are not coined out. They are not fanciful talk. They are not uh, theories. They are not all others. They are not uh, things that, that we can call fantasy. Or uh, they, are not, they, are, they are not things that, that can be said to be ideal. But they are not achievable. Lord, uh, these are things that are real. These are things that God has uh, by his spirit made the man of God to know. And they have been spoken. They have been brought out. They have flowed out of the mouth and the heart of the man of God. Lord in heaven, may the people receive the word. May the word grow wings and then enter their hearts, all of their hearts, and then do the work that ought to be done. Thank you, my Father and my God, because you have answered our prayers. Glory and honor and praise and power and dominion and excellency be unto the Lord, the Father of our Lord Jesus and our Father and his God and our God now and forevermore. And let the people of the Lord that have heard my word, even the word of the Lord, that have agreed to what, agreed with what they have heard, that have nodded their heads and have nodded their hearts in agreement. Let them all shout a great amen. amen. amen.